Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the inaugural Before the Bell event. We are thrilled that you're here. My name is Catherine Clark. I'm one of your co-hosts for this morning. Alors, je vous, je vous souhaite la bienvenue aujourd'hui, mesdames et messieurs, à cette nouvelle série d'événements en direct. We are live today from Canada's NAC, live from Ottawa. We have all of you brave people who have joined us in the uh, wintry early morning hours of, uh, of an Ottawa, Ottawa morning to be here with us. We also have a huge number of people who are joining us uh, via live stream for this event as well from the comfort the, of their own homes. Um, we can, uh, I hope that that doesn't uh, encourage you to stay home next time and snuggle under your duvets as you, uh, as you know that that's an option from here forward. So this is an opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, because it is an inaugural event for you to be able to say to your grandchildren, I was there. I hope you're gonna remember this morning. Susan Delacourt and I were talking that uh, because of that, as you, uh, you know, years from now look back and say that you were a part of this incredible event, uh, Susan and I are gonna work very hard not to mess this up for you. But um, I'm gonna explain very briefly about the format for Before, before the Bell, because it comes in three parts. It's a, it's a Canadian series. It's going to feature candid conversations with some of the most influential people who are behind the big policy d uh, decisions that are affecting Canadians. We're going to be talking about a subject today that's on the mind of a lot of people. It's the issue of trade. Uh, clearly, this is impacting not just um, a certain sector of Canadian society, but businesses across the country and the work that they can do, uh, not just nationally, but internationally. We're heading towards more NAFTA talks at the end of this month in Montreal, so it's even more of a topic of conversation. Uh, let me talk to you about Susan's part. Susan Delacourt uh, is running The Pulse. This is, um, this is an opportunity for Susan to talk about the issues, the policy issues that are affecting uh, Parliament Hill that are affecting Canadians and that are affecting Canada's place in the world. Following The Pulse, I will be leading the policy segment. I'll be interviewing expert guests and key influencers to explore the issues that Susan will have touched on, but just in a little bit more depth. And in the final segment, The People, that's you, we are going to be turning, <coughs> pardon me, to our, just a second, <clears throat> pardon me, to our live audience guests, so that's all of you here in the crowd today, and we're also going to be turning to our live stream audience, who are going, we're hoping that you will all have tons of questions, and we're asking you to pose them through Slido. A lot of you will have heard of Slido because you've been a part of, of um, events that we've put on before, but Slido is a digital mechanism, and what Slido does is it allows you to go to www.slido.com, so I encourage you to take out your mobile devices and type that in. We have a hashtag for this event, which is hashtag BTB trade. You need to put that in on the main page of Slido in order to join the conversation in a digital sense. And at that point, you can ask questions. You'll see there's a simple way that you can type in your question. You can also vote on questions that have already been posed by other people. That helps to move those questions further up the queue. So Slido is the digital mechanism that we will be using, both for some voting segments in Susan Delacourt's Pulse, and also later in the show when we get to, uh, when we get to the question and answer session. So once again, it's up on the uh, screens. You can see it, the hashtag and the website that you need to go to, so it's pretty self-explanatory. And uh, I'd like to quickly mention that Before the Bell is made possible with support from Forest Products Association of Canada, Export Development Canada, the National Arts Centre, and Skyfly Productions. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to turn the show over to the mighty Susan Delacourt. <laughs> thank you, Catherine. And thank you, everybody, for coming out today. Uh, this is, uh, you're all part of uh, the inauguration. We're, uh, we're just gonna see how this goes. And um, you're going to be part of it too. Um, we're gonna have a little discussion here before the, the main event. And we're gonna ask people, you with your devices, to vote on the questions that we're discussing. We're gonna have a little conversation and then we're gonna see whether your views agree with what we're hearing up here. So. Um, first, I'll introduce my, I, I think this is a great panel to be uh, some of my most admired people in Ottawa on stage here with me. 
Uh, we have to my immediate left, Sarah Goldfeder from uh, Principal with Ernst Cliff Strategy Group, Nick Nanos, Chairman of Nanos Research, and Amy Karem, uh, President of Karem Consulting. All of these, uh, these folks have lots to say about trade and uh, the issues that are sort of currently on the agenda. So we're, the way we're going to do it, though, is um, one question discussed among here. You'll, uh, you'll vote on it, then we'll uh, come back and another question. We're hoping to get through three or four before uh, we have to stop. All right, so Nick, we're going to start with you. Um, is Canada, and here's a question for all of you, is Canada prepared for trade uncertainty within North America? So yeah, I would say that I'll speak to Canadians as the pollster. I believe that Canadians are prepared. Why? Two reasons. First of all, we have to think of two things being put together. First of all, live reality television in terms of the Trump administration. And second, I'll call it the zombie policy apocalypse, these two <laughs> different factors that are happening. And you know, I think this is good. You know, the reality is, is that when Canadians, and they are very interested in trade right now and tuned in, the last time they were interested in trade was in the 1980s under Brian Mulroney. That was an exceptionally important part of Canada's future. And you know, it might have been controversial, but Canadians were tuned into trade. They had a dialogue and debate about trade. They talked about Canada's future and had competing visions, and we got the free trade agreement and then eventually the North American free trade agreement. Fast forward now, and you know, whether you love him or hate him, the fact that Donald Trump tweets and engages on trade in Canada actually puts it on the radar of Canadians as something to talk about that's at the water cooler. And I would say that's a good thing. Second of all, we have, I'll call the zombie policy apocalypse, <laughs> it's kind of like the walking dead, you know, the thing is, is, this is a bit like a relationship. So think of Canada being a relationship and our partner saying, you know what, I'm not sure if this is working for me. What does that make us do? That makes us re-examine our relationship. It makes us examine our role, not just in terms of our partner, but around the world. And, you know, when you roll up kind of this uncertainty, right, in terms of what's happening, you know, I would say the Canadians are prepared, and they're prepared because they're talking about it. And I think it's important for us to continue to talk about trade, and not just our trade with the United States, but our trade around the world. And, uh, and I think it, it can only be a good thing, even with all these crazy things that are happening. Okay, points for zombie mention in before breakfast. <laughs> uh, Amy, your thoughts on this? Uh, I'm gonna slightly disagree with Nick, in that I, I really don't think that we're, we're ready. And the reason is 75% of our exports, exports are to the US. Uh, what worries me is we don't have a diver diversification strategy, an export diversification strategy. And as many of you know, right, you, your financial advisors will always say diversify, diversify. And what happened to uh, the Nortel folks who put a whole bunch of their stock in, you know, their retirement fund into Nortel stock. So uh, that's the aspect that worries me. And, and we're not, we're just too comfortable. We're, we've become a little bit too complacent. It's been easy selling next door. And I've, I've talked to some entrepreneurs, some small medium enterprises, and they're like, no, I really haven't thought about going abroad. I, I have no idea where to start you know, where the opportunities are. So I'm good with the US market. So it, in that respect, I think we, we need to do a, an aggressive shift. Um, and that's, that's the aspect of why I think we're really not ready yet. Sarah, where are you on this one? Well, I think it's important to remember that governments aren't the ones that are engaged in trade. Businesses are engaged in trade. And I think at the end of the day, what you're going to find, regardless of whether or not there are trade agreements in place, businesses will find some place to sell their products. And, and it's like you know, water around rocks in a stream. There may be obstacles, there may be challenges, uh, and businesses will look to government to help them with those, overcome those challenges. But I think at the end of the day, Canada is a trading nation, and nobody does that better in the world, really. And so when you look at what your financial prospects are, what your market prospects are, people want Canadian goods, and, and trade agreements are not in place. If, Canada, if Canadian businesses want to sell overseas, they will. 
So I think what, what we have here is an interesting distinction, and, and uh, the, I'm thinking we'll probably see this show up in the, in the results too, is when we say Canada, are we talking about Canadian business, are we talking about Canadian people, or are we talking about the government, and the minister is here. So, um, so feel free to vote on that the way you like. And uh, we are now seeing the poll results. And there's a slight, my pan, fellow panelists here, I have the advantage. There is a slight advantage to yes. 53% uh, say yes, 47% say no. Um, is Canada's progressive internationalism, the, uh, that anybody who has been uh, reading recent articles about this, Canada's progressive internationalism trade policy helping or hurting our ability to negotiate new trade deals. So we're going to start with Sarah. Sarah, you might want to just like give a, a, a capsule summary of what progressive internationalism is. Sure. Well, I think you know, from, from what I understand, the Canadian government is, is, is trying to do with, these, with the progressive uh, trade ag uh, agenda is move trade, trade deals into an area of social policy. And I think that's always a challenge. When you try to use a trade agreement to do something other than regulate trade, I think it's always going to be a challenge with your partners. Um, and so Canada's taken the lead on this. They did so with CETA. Um, you know, and in, uh, in, the, in the process of, of kind of the final days of that negotiation and, and the, the finalization of that, Justin Trudeau standard, stood in front of a European audience and talked about the importance of, of trade deals impacting the people that live in the countries that those trade deals are, are between. And that is important. And what you saw in the United States is that that, that, connect, that was a disconnect. And so there was a, there's a loss of support for trade agreements in the United States because people aren't feeling that the effects of the positive benefits of those trade agreements and they feel that businesses are getting all of those, um, all those positive effects. So there is a challenge in this whenever you ask a trade agreement to do something that's not trade and whether it's law enforcement pieces, whether it's social policy, and, and it's a, an easier deal when you're doing something like the, you know, the, the deal in Europe where you have a bunch of countries that are about the same step in, ec in economic maturity and social policy and political maturity. But when you're dealing with disparate countries such as you know, that exist within the TPP, it's going to be a much bigger challenge. Nick, you have thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I think it's a, a mixed bag. So think of it this way. Can I make a prediction? Of course. Okay. Especially so if it involves zombies. I would say zombies. that in 20 years, progressive trade is going to be a gimme. The problem for Canada is that when you're the first, no one else is in that frame, right? And it makes it very difficult. So, you know, I think the, the challenge for the government is how can they move forward a progressive trade agenda, not just for Canada, but so that other countries can start to adopt that progressive trade agenda? Is the government willing to compromise a little bit to get a little bit of a progressive trade agenda to start a broader dialogue, or is it kind of a firm line in the sand? So, you know, I think the challenge is, is that we're talking a new language and a language of the future probably for a lot of trade, but no one else is in that space and you know if you're in the trade space uh, no offense some of my best friends are in the trade space <laughs> they're kind of like hyper geeky rules based people <laughs> who live in the post World War II era in terms of kind of uh, you know how many how many trade angels can mm -hmm. dance on the head of a pin so uh, to talk about progressive trade is just almost foreign so I think the challenge is when we're first to talk about this it's just we're just talking a different language than many other people but I think we're ahead of the wave on this Amy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. We are ahead of the wave, and I think that's where pulling in our allies is going to be really important, right? Uh, strength in numbers. Uh, we, we do need to remind ourselves of, of our size on the global scale, and uh, I, I absolutely agree. These are fantastic principles and values that we need to stick by, um, but if, if the ultimate goal is impact, uh, we certainly need to make this a long-term strategy, uh, rally other allies, um, and yes, as, as Sarah and Nick said, uh, proliferate this um, in, a, in a broader sense. Uh, at the same time, I think timing is everything, as, as many of you know, in, in really good negotiations. Uh, it's, it's a timing thing, and I'm looking forward to learning more about our government's uh, timing strategy and, and the trade-offs. I think it's, it's showing in our actions, and, and I'm getting it, um, but I think that's really where we're going to see success or um, the apparent trade-off in, in our timing decisions. So I'm going to ask the panel to send your quick thing, um, which the audience now can vote on too. Uh, helping, hurting. Sarah? 
Oh. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not them binary. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think probably, if anything, you know, within depending on the agreement, right? So yeah. in Europe, I think it w- I think it's helpful, and and with TPP, I think it's going to be a real challenge to getting to a deal. Good answer. Nick, short-term hurt, long-term help. Nice. Okay, Amy. You notice how all the panelists are trying to have it both ways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if the end goal is signing a trade deal, it's hurting. Okay. Yeah. And what is our... Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> um, most of the audience, almost, uh, well, 58% believe it's helping and 42% hurting. Now, how many of you are sucking up to the minister? <laughs> All right. Um, our third question. Is it possible for Canada to protect its national interest in trade negotiations? And Amy, we're going to start with you on this one. Yes, absolutely. It's possible. Uh, It's uh, necessary. And I think it's expected. Um, That's what we've elected them to do, right? And uh, I think they're doing a great job. And I I think it's also uh, the key to the success, really, is um, defining what is um, a deal breaker um, and a nice to have, and I think that's that's really going to be the the weaving process and the maneuvering um, that will continue. Uh, and uh, I think they're doing a great job, uh, but at the same time, and at the same time, uh, now it's time to take the the uh, polls that we've taken from our people and give the guidance back and be really clear in terms of what are the parameters. Right in terms of what is included um, and and what are uh, the engagement um, guidelines, if you will, uh, in in trade. So, for example, um, Acon, right, the deal for 1.5 billion dollars, and uh, a Chinese company is looking to buy it. Well, is is that in our national interest? Uh, what what are the guidelines for that? Or uh, is, is the trade um, parameter that foreigner, foreign investment can be only so much, right? Yes, we would love to welcome foreign investment, but buyouts, mm, not so much, right? So if we define national interest in terms of protecting our economy or building our economy uh, and growing it in certain ways, I think that's, that's where the um, two-way engagement, right, government and private sector is, is going to become really valuable. Nick? I think it's difficult. Uh, I think average Canadians tend to think of the, especially the trade relationship with the United States as a binary, relatively equal, state-to-state enterprise. And uh, what was a big eye-opener for me, I remember meeting folks in the State Department in the United States, is that I I came in with that idea because that's what I learned as a kid and what I learned in school, right? There's Canada and the United States. It sounds equal. Sounds very binary. But the reality is, is, you know, I remember talking to someone in the State Department and what they basically said is, hey, we're a global power. How do you fit into our strategy? So yes, we have a binary relationship with Canada, but when we're talking, when we're engaging with Canada, we're also thinking about Mexico at the same time, although it might not be articulated at the table. We're thinking about China. We're thinking about Europe. So just think of Canada going in thinking in a binary sense, like, hey, we have a great relationship. We're your neighbor and stuff like that. And the Americans having a different frame, because if they had the same frame as we did, we would, the deal would be done. There would be a new NAFTA. It would be modernized. So I think it's difficult to protect our national interests because we're dealing with a global superpower that has other interests and is trying to fit us into what is important for them. So Sarah, and these will be the wrap-up comments too, so uh, we'll right. leave you to... And, and also, the, the whole idea of... I think there's, there is some confusion between national interest and Canada first, too. Like, I, right. Well, yeah. I think there's a lot of definitions of national interest, and different groups of people are going to have a different definition of what's in Canadians' national interest. So you have individuals thinking about, as a consumer, what's in your best interest as a consumer, what's in the national interest as, you know, as an engine of economic growth, what's in the best interest of Canadians 
security at the end of the day. And I think Nick's really right. And, you know, and, and I was smiling because that was my former employer, the U.S. State Department. <laughs> and 100%, I understand that you know, when the United States comes to the bargaining table, the United States is thinking about what it wants. It's not thinking about what you want. And, and so that's, and that's going to be a challenge in any negotiation with a global economic power, not just the United States, but also China. Because China's looking at what it wants out of the deal. And, and I think that that's, that's why sometimes for um, kind of a more of a medium economic power, a multilateral agreement may, in the end, work to your national interest better than a, a bilateral agreement. All that said, I think it's really important to go back to the different definitions of national interest and look at you know, the different issues within that and see you know, what is in Canada's national interest on supply management, for example, because I think you're going to have several different answers depending on who you talk to. So now, uh, actually, the audience gets the last word. Uh, we'll see, is it possible for Canada to protect its national interests? Uh, yes or no? A, a binary question. <laughs> Um, and uh, overwhelming, so our polarization has ended. This is a lovely way to end it. 96% uh, said yes. So uh, with that, thank you all for helping launch this. Um, we're going to move back to the main stage and Catherine and our distinguished guests. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for that uh, excellent and high-powered and dynamic uh, conversation to start off our morning. And I agree with Susan, it's a good idea to always reference zombies before breakfast. So thank you for that, Nick. Gets us all awake. So um, now we're on to the policy segment, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm delighted to have three distinguished guests who are joining me on stage this morning. But they're going to be doing it one by one so that we can have a, a quick one-on-one -on -one discussion with, with each of them before we go to audience questions. Uh, everyone got a real flavor, and you're all uh, Slido pros by this point. Uh, when we get to the end of my session, that's when we'll be going to longer format questions from the audience. So you can start inputting those questions at any point that they uh, occur, to, occur to you during the morning. So let me introduce, please, ladies and gentlemen, my first guest, Derek Nyber, who is the CEO of Forest Products Association of Canada. Uh, Derek uh, has been going through some uh, fairly interesting times lately as he works to support his association members. Of course, we, um, we've heard uh, a lot of us off with lumber. Uh, what was more of a surprise last week was hearing uh, a lot about newsprint. I'm sure you were thrilled. Yeah. So um, let's talk a little bit about that newsprint um, issue which arose. Derek, and can you talk to me? about what you think actually happened, what's going on with that? Yeah, I think it's the backdrop of protectionism uh, in the U.S. And, and this is for our sector, this is the third trade action now, a super calendared paper, which is the paper that you'll find in magazines or, or newspaper inserts, softwood lumber, and now newsprint. And some people will say, well, newsprint isn't, isn't aren't newspapers dying, isn't newsprint dying? Well. Actually, we still export over $2 billion of newsprint to the U.S. alone every year. Uh, in a place like Cornerbrook, Newfoundland, that's 500 direct jobs. Uh, another 2,000 throughout the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. In Powell River, that's about 500 jobs. In, in, uh, in Crofton on Vancouver Island, it's about 400 jobs. So, you know, we're thousands of jobs across Canada. In a category that's declining about 10% a year, but for, for, the foreseeable, for the next few years, there's still a pretty good business there. Uh, the mill in Cornerbrook, uh, um, further to Amy's comments, Cornerbrook has diversified. They, they only send about half of their newsprint to the U.S. The other half goes elsewhere around the world. So uh, the di diversification is happening. Uh, but what this has done is, is these mills, as they're looking at the runways that they have, they're looking at investments over the long term to transform those mills into other innovative products. And, and the challenge this newsprint case presents is, is really fast tracking uh, the challenge uh, and, and not giving them maybe some of the time to make those investments to, to move into other product areas. So a real surprise, um, really unfortunate, and similar to Softwood Lumber, basically founded on creative writing. <laughs> so the government of Canada actually um, went to the uh, WTO and filed complaints on both softwood lumber and with regards to um, the newsprint issue. And I guess I'm wondering if this is in fact a test to ensure that um, any new NAFTA agreement that may or may not be developed actually maintains a, a dispute resolution clause. 
Yeah, I think it's a must for us um, uh, in NAFTA and, and also to ensure that the U.S. is following the, the requirements under WTO. Uh, we were one of the first groups to support the government last week when that WTO action came out, although it's not just about us. That was a very broad move referencing um, other countervailing duties and other trade actions to other countries. Um, and we've seen in the last year alone uh, a 50% increase in those kind of trade actions from the U.S. alone. Um, that's concerning. Uh, and a lot of people can blame Trump alone for that. And, 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 you know, I think we've had debates in the industry, would softwood lumber have happened with Hillary Clinton as president? I think the answer is probably yes. But I think the ongoing narrative around protectionism, and if you look back to the newsprint piece, that's a trade action filed by one mill of 260 people in Seattle, Washington, that's owned by a hedge fund. Uh, so, you know, my first, is this an attempt at extortion to get money from Canadian industry to buy them off? Uh, because there's not one other newsprint facility in the U.S. that's supporting them. And, and, and also, we have a thousand small newspapers in the U.S., we have book publishers. So we have far more people in the U.S. against this because they know this is going to drive up their costs as it has for home builders in the U.S. with softwood lumber. Yeah, that was an interesting and, and uh, bottom of the page part of the story uh, that I think was may have been missed by uh, by a lot of people reading up on on this issue. Well, and I think for the for the previous panel talking about what's in it for the U.S. and and this has been one of our frustrations because the U.S. is not going to care about those jobs in Corner Brook. We care about them very much, but the U.S. won't. But the U.S. should care about the costs being going up for for home builders and and home renovators and 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 new home buyers in Florida. They should be concerned about small small-town newspapers in, in Nebraska and Iowa paying more and, and possibly needing to close their papers because of these additional costs. And that's a big frustration. They don't seem to be getting that it's, it's their own people really being hurt here as well. I want to talk to you a little bit about your, your industry in another sense. Um, up to this point, the public perception, up until relatively recently, I think it's fair to say, yeah. uh, the public perception of your industry may not have been one that um, was environmentally friendly. People mm -hmm. may not have looked at the work that your uh, associated companies and industries were doing as one that was environmentally friendly. What are you doing? To, um, to actually improve that image as you move forward. Yeah, we've come a long way, and I reference Elizabeth May when I talk about this, because Elizabeth was chaining herself to the trees <laughs> in the West about 30 to 40 years ago, uh, and she's now one of our biggest supporters in terms of the work that we're doing. And, and I think it's, the, it, it's a combination of things. I think um, you know, the ongoing engagement on the ground with Indigenous peoples in terms of planning that's happening, uh, the role that forestry plays in, in, in carbon, um, in, in, in mitigating carbon and climate change, which is big for this government. Across the country, on average, depending on species, we harvest the trees about, at about 80 years old. If you leave trees in, just they're either going to burn or they're going to rot. And, and last year, we lost 1.1 million hectares of forest in the interior of BC. And last year, we lost 24 times the number of trees that we harvested to fires and pests. And that speaks to the need. You know, so, so there's significant environmental benefits that come with, with active forest management, plus just the cycles. We're planning in 150 and 200 year cycles, uh, uh, strictly regulated at the provincial and federal level. So that's moved a lot. Um, but it's about continuous improvement because the customers want uh, you know, sustainably sourced product, uh, not only in Canada but around the world. So, so as we think about the global market and, and expanding markets, that, that, that social responsibility factor continues to be really important. And undoubtedly plays into the idea of a progressive international uh, trade agenda exactly. as well. Derek, you're not going far. I'm just going to go down there. But you're just going to go down yeah, there. Yeah, thank you. Derek's just moving down the stage briefly. Thank you, uh, Derek, for those comments. Because um, now I'm going to bring up our second guest, ladies and gentlemen, Mairead Lavery, who is the Senior Vice President of Business Development at EDC. Uh, we gave you a little taste of music there, Mairead. Oh, yes. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, Catherine. So uh, clearly, the government's trade agenda is of keen interest to Absolutely. EDC. And I guess we should probably start talking about um, whether you can talk to us regarding some of EDC's trade initiatives that support that progressive agenda. Sure. Thanks for that question, Catherine. So absolutely, it's extremely important to us. And uh, 
what we are very focused on um, are obviously looking at what the exporter needs are and, and how we can actually support Canadian companies and our exporters. But the agenda fits in very nicely when you think of some of the capabilities and the areas of growth in Canada. So clean tech's a wonderful example where you have an environmental benefit, so that progressive agenda item of environment linked to a strength, which is our Canadian clean tech companies. So we've been very focused over the last uh, number of years in expanding our support to Canadian clean tech companies. So we have supported uh, in the last four years about $3.5 billion worth of business, 170 clean tech companies exporting to 114 countries in the world. So when Amy mentioned diversification, that's a great example where we're getting really strong Canadian companies out into the market and really helping them grow from being this Canadian expert to being a global enterprise. So clean tech and environment, a huge part of uh, the progressive trade agenda. Also the environment just in general itself. So EDC, one of the, actually the first ECA to adopt the OECD standards on coal-fired power stations where we don't support those anymore. And we continue to evolve that and remove support from areas unless we can see significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. So very clearly on the environment, as it relates to gender issues, women-owned businesses, a key priority for us. There's a very um, comprehensive ecosystem in Canada, but there are gaps. So what we want to do is go and address where there are gaps and help women-owned businesses actually be able to grow their business uh, internationally. And that's a, that's a key focus for us, uh, certainly this last year and moving into this year. One of the other things is how do we also support indigenous-owned companies and another areas of focus uh, for us. So clean tech, uh, gender-based uh, decisions, indigenous peoples, looking at the other groups that perhaps benefit from these, uh, not only the free trade agreements, but the actual agenda itself. Are there particular markets that are of most interest to your clients? Uh, that's really interesting. I mean, Amy mentioned the statistic, and of course our clients mostly export to the U.S., but our job is a diversification uh, job. So we have got to get them interested in other markets. Asia Pacific is a huge opportunity. It matches very well the capabilities of Canadian companies, and we have to encourage them. We have to demonstrate how to do business in those countries, give them the tools that they need to do business, and be on the ground to help them. So our agenda has been very focused on growing and representing how you can actually do business in these more challenging and markets that perhaps people don't necessarily think about. So the EDC uh, strategy has actually been to get boots on the ground in these markets, our 20 offices. In fact, we have none currently in the U.S., although uh, perhaps we'll have to think a little bit about that as we need to help our exporters remove some of the uncertainty uh, linked to the current negotiations. So uh, give them the knowledge, give them the financing, and help them reduce the risk of getting to those markets. But without a doubt, um, the growth in Asia Pacific is very easy to actually uh, introduce to our clients. The opportunities are there, and we've got to help them diversify to get there. So there are nonetheless a lot of ups and downs right now for people in terms of, of trade in general, NAFTA in particular, but trade in general. You're still bullish on Canadian trade. Why? Because uh, the, when, I take, when I meet with Canadian companies, their skill set, their capabilities just match the needs of foreign buyers. There are markets out there, so I'm extremely bullish. I mean, we have invested quite significantly in actually <laughs> trying to help uh, Canadian companies find the one thing they need. Guess what that is? A foreign buyer. So we're very focused in getting out into the markets, using the tools we have at our disposal to make relationships with those foreign companies and introduce Canadian companies to them. And when we go through that process, without exception, the foreign buyers say, I didn't realize the talent and the companies that existed in Canada. So they're very... Um, they like the Canadian brand. They like what it stands for. They're very willing to introduce Canadian companies. We have to help them 
understand what's available, the capability that's available in Canada, and we have to get the Canadian companies perhaps over the hurdle of uh, being able to deal with the risks of working with those foreign buyers. So that's where we're making our significant investment. We have a team of 50 people who I call my, my favorite words are match.com, and their job is to match <laughs> Canadian companies to foreign buyers. So uh, that's what we're trying to do to help them with that diversification. That's fantastic. You probably never thought you'd no, have, have high-level matchmaker on your, <laughs> uh, <laughs> on your resume. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Kathy. You're, not, you're also not going far. You're yeah. just, um, we're playing musical chairs yeah. here. And you're going to be a part of our discussion in just a few moments as well. As well. And Derek has kept your, uh, your seat ready. And I'm now delighted to uh, call up to the stage our third and final guest, François-Philippe Champagne, who is the Minister of International Trade. Um, who has uh, probably got more aeroplane miles than uh, any of us. Good morning. Good morning. What a pleasure. Thank you for being here. Merci. On l'apprécie énormément. Yeah, first show on trade. Oh, and, and you're a part I of it. the way is that people are always right. I look at the poll and, yeah. and I They're think They're always right if the polls wisdom. go your way. Well, listen, you know, <laughs> that I saw a lot of wisdom this morning in the polls. But it, it's, it's very nice to be with all of you this morning. Talking about trade and, and the impact of trade on our people and... And so delighted, honestly, that you chose that because uh, this is really having an impact on all Canadians and not just Canadians, but people around the world. So happy to share some thoughts with you. Do you have a crystal ball that lets you predict what's going to happen in the NAFTA negotiations at the end of the month? Geez, I wish, uh, but, but one thing I can say, and I think people have seen it and other panelists have uh, mentioned that. We knew it would be difficult. Uh, we knew it would be complex. Uh, but I think what Canadians expect of us, Catherine, is to be constructive, to be solution-oriented, to be at the table, uh, but also to stand firm. You may have seen me this week and say, you know, sometime uh, it's good to send a strong message, a message of firmness and say, we talk about the forest industry, we talked when there was this discussion about unfair duties on Bombardier. We stood firm and we sent a strong signal. So no crystal ball, but a resolve to make it work. Uh, we remind our friends uh, south of the border that this is an agreement that has provided prosperity to, to our people. Millions of jobs, middle class jobs, depend on, on, on that agreement. Uh, I often put numbers, you know, this is two billion of goods and services exchanged every day. This is 400,000 people uh, crossing the border. In Canada, uh, is the largest client in the United States, bigger than China, Japan, and the UK combined. Uh, so oftentimes when you put that in perspective and you saw Team Canada playing, making sure that we engage not only with the White House, uh, but with governors, with mayor, with business people. You know, when you have the president of the US Chamber of Commerce agreeing with the Canadian position, I think that it says a lot about uh, you know, our position and our constructive nature at this table. You, one of the countries you were in most recently was China. Yeah. Uh, you got left behind in Beijing to- For to, good reason. For a good reason, for a good reason, but to continue uh, with further conversations there. Can I ask you if you think that the progressive element of the government's trade, trade uh, agenda is in fact impacting the ability to have discussions with certain countries like China? Well, first of all, I'm happy you mentioned uh, that because uh, this was a topic uh, discussed before. Uh, with respect to China, listen, uh, we've been clear to Canadians and to our friends, uh, this was not about next Friday. Uh, this is about the next few decades. I mean, this is a partner with, we exchange 85 billion of bilateral trade, uh, uh, you know, becoming the largest economy of the world. And it's part of our diversification strategy. I think some panelists mentioned that, you know, you need to diversify and clearly, uh, things are shifting in Asia. So this is part of our broad-based strategy. I would say quite the opposite, you know, our progressive trade agenda. And what is progressive trade agenda? It's all about making sure that trade works for people. Trade is about people. Uh, you cannot do trade today like you used to do a few decades ago. You're leaving way too many people behind. People won't accept that. That's why you see the disconnect. I often say trade is not a race to the bottom. It's a march to the top. When we say that we should talk about gender in trade agreement, when we say that we should be protecting the environment while we trade, when we say that we should protect workers while we trade, that makes sense. That resonates with people around the world. And I can assure you that ministers often say to Canada, please continue to be ambitious 
in these elements because it allows us domestically to raise the standard. No one in this room, no Canadians watching us would want us to be trading and say, well, we'll be doing more trade by reducing standards. People expect us in the 21st century in 2018 to make sure that you respect the environment, that you respect workers, that you talk about gender. I often say, you know, which game can you win with 50% of the team on the bench? That just makes sense. So I would say quite the opposite, and people were right. That's what distinguished Canada and the world. You know, you were right to say that our trade agreement with Europe was the most progressive. It's the one which is the gold standard of the world. But I can tell you, for example, that what you see in that agreement now, a lot of countries, the European Union, are trying to replicate. Canada was the first G7 nation to have a gender chapter. I can tell you when I got the WTO and they say, Minister, can we get that clause again? Because, you know, it just makes sense. You know, I think Europe is going to replicate that in its trade agreement, many nations. So, yes, you are at the forefront. Yes, uh, sometimes it may uh, sound difficult, but that's how you move the needle. That's how you make progress in the world. That's how you distinguish Canada. I can assure you, uh, when you look at NAFTA, for example, what's difficult, it's not the progressive stuff. It's the same stuff that Brian Mulroney was fighting at the time. It, dispute resolution, it's chapter 19, it's about procurement. Those are the tough issues that remain in trade agreements. But I would say, uh, and the people were right, the progressive element is what makes people want to invest in Canada. Millenniums are voting with their feet and their values. We sit in our numbers, we sit with the number of students, and, and I think Canadians have given us a broad social and political license to have a broad-based trade agenda, but they want us to trade with our values and our principle. Final question before we go to audience questions uh, via Slido, and that's about TPP. Yeah. What's going on? Can we salvage it? Yeah, I mean, listen, we made a lot of progress in Da Nang, uh, but there's still things to, to, to work out. I mean, I must say that uh, the way it was left uh, where we took it when we took government is that uh, the previous government compromised on too much. Uh, so we came to the table, I came to the table, and say, hold on for a minute. Uh, I think Canadians expect us to stand up for them, uh, whether it's the auto sector, whether it's culture, to make sure that uh, we just don't get any deal, but we get a good deal. Again, I'm saying these deals are there for decades to come, so uh, it is significant for us to get them right. And that's what I stood up for Canada uh, last time. And I think that's what gives confidence to Canadians when they say in Asabras. They know we're, we're having their back, they know we're at the forefront, but they want us to engage with confidence, uh, smartly, making sure that we open up market, but that we also care for our industries, for our workers, for the middle class. That's what I do when I stand abroad. I stand up for Canadians and making sure that at the same time, uh, we develop these markets uh, in, in Asia or in South America. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Real pleasure. So that's not, that's not it. We have uh, questions now, which we'll get to for, uh, for all three of you. The first question, will there be a new trade strategy and how will the federal departments collaborate to bring together a competitive Canada brand package on the international stage? And Mr. Minister, I think we'll throw that question to you first. Well, I, I think we have one. I, I'd say, you know, what is attracting Canada? Uh, I often say stability, predictability, rule of law, very inclusive society and one which cherish diversity. Uh, I think you saw it in our, our feminist trade, you know, uh, international trade strategy. Uh, you sit in the way we're promoting Canada abroad. Um, diversification is key. I, I keep saying there's never been a better time to diversify. We did that with Europe. We're looking at South America. We're looking at Asia Pacific. And I'll leave uh, Canadians to think, what well, we represent what? Canada represents 0.5% of the world population and about 2.5% of global trade. So I often say that trade is part of our DNA. And I'll say that I never present Canada as a country of some 35 million people but rather a country today which has preferential market access to 1.2 billion consumers. Because in today's world, what matters is market access. It's not the size of your population. And through our trade agreements, we get market access. That's what matters for Canadian companies. And we said it at the panel, how do you access these markets? My job is to bring that 1.2 billion number up. Maureen, I'd like to just briefly have your comments on this, especially with regards to the Canada brand package, yeah. because that's a lot of what you're doing at EDC. Yeah, so maybe two specific examples uh, to demonstrate. Clean tech was one that I mentioned. You know, again, leveraging, uh, we've been working really closely with BDC, SDTC, TCS, and ourselves. 
uh, to actually make sure that we apply all of the benefits of all those four organizations into those clean tech companies to leverage them to actually be able to take them uh, to the world stage. Um, so that's a, that, that's a significant coordination to actually help one company. That's one example. Uh, another example will be the Accelerated Growth Service Initiative uh, of the government to actually bring all federal departments together with companies that need that we can accelerate their growth package on. So yet another example. And then ourselves with uh, Trade Commissioner Service, a very important um, uh, front field for EDC given that they have so many offices in so many um, countries of the world. We, can, we work very closely with trade commissioners and are continuing to enhance that relationship by bringing the knowledge they have to Canadian exporters, by understanding how we do missions together, how we work together in those markets to actually leverage um, the connections that both organizations have. So three examples, it's core to what we do all the time to ensure we get the best buying for the buck. Um, but uh, three very specific examples. So the next question is beyond finishing TPP and a future trade deal with China, what other countries is Canada looking at as potential partners? And Derek, I'm actually going to ask you to address the, the, the final element of that in terms of what other countries is Canada looking at. Uh, as potential partners and from your perspective with FPAC. Yeah, we see tariff relief opportunities in places like Vietnam, Malaysia, uh, Mexico. Uh, uh, I know Vietnam, there are 90 million people in Vietnam uh, and also a lot of the furniture manufacturing has moved from China to Vietnam. So that would be the top of the list. I think the tariff uh, saving opportunities are in the 30% range there. So huge opportunity for us. Yeah, and Marie, you talked about a few of them as well in terms yeah, of... Yeah, so maybe first off, first place to go is the, car the Canadian tariff finder which was done by TCS, EDC and BDC which actually shows you uh, current free trade agreements that are in play and which country has the lowest tariff so you can actually go online and check that. Uh, very clearly a move towards the east. I talked about Asia Pacific. Um, you know, th that market is so huge. You have markets in there that are very similar to Canada, like Australia, where people could have a very ease of doing business that's similar to working in Canada and even easier perhaps than the US, because let's remember the number of states we have in the US that are actually all with their own individual regulations. Um, right through to the more forward-looking um, markets that are Diffic more difficult like Indonesia, et cetera, but lots of opportunity for Canadian products. The needs of those emerging markets are what Canadians are very strong at doing. So I'm still, um, you know, we have markets all over the world, but Asia Pacific just represents such a significant opportunity and all the many countries of both ASEAN, the different provinces in China, and then the more developed markets of Japan and Australia. If I could just quickly add, one of the things we see in our is, is there tends to be the age, the Asia focus, um, there's a perception that it's a, just the West, you know, so BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, um, and there's been some talk in the industry about how do we better empower some of the folks who might think they're too far uh, from the Asia market. So I think there needs to be some work in our sector and others to get some of the Eastern players to be thinking that there is opportunity in, in, in Asia for them. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's recent trip to China didn't go well. This is our next question. That's actually a comment. Uh, what does Canada do if Trump pulls the plug on NAFTA? Uh, Mr. Minister, you may or may not agree I with the... I would ask one of the other <laughs> panelists that question. I don't know. I was ready to answer the other questions. So. I know. <laughs> uh, so you may or may not agree with the first part of it, but I, I, I think disagree. everyone's and interested I actually, in... Actually, it depends how you define success. I think... Uh, you know, when you deal with China, uh, you have to look over time. Uh, and, and I think that to get it right and to engage, like I said, it's a very important trading partner. But if, if I go, what does it, uh, Trump pulls out? I think, uh, and it's not me, as some of wisdom came from the people, it's about diversification. Um, you know, clearly that my job, and I think you said it in the previous question, we have a lot on our plate. Uh, we have just opened uh, the market in Europe, more than 500 million consumers, and I think that's quite significant for people watching us. Uh, we still have to take the full benefit of that. I mean, uh, Canada has a preferential market access to the largest consumer market of the world. I was traveling Canada, and it's really making a difference. You know, uh, uh, there, there's very little difference between being in Ottawa today and Toulouse or, or Milan and, and, and Montreal. Uh, so clearly, we need to take benefit of that. 
But then if I shift, I look north-south, clearly South America, you know, we were at the Pacific Alliance, uh, which is Mexico, Chile, Colombia, and Peru. Uh, we have been asked to upgrade our uh, membership, and we're doing that, and it's good, because that is also a very uh, up-and-coming middle class. And the other one is Mercosur, and Mercosur is about Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay, where I was just uh, uh, before Christmas. Uh, so we're looking north-south, and I can say in Asia-Pacific, and I think was mentioned before, uh, we have started discussion with the ASEAN countries. Uh, we're continuing, like we said, with TPP. Uh, we've been very involved in India. Um, so we're going to continue. I think it's a broad-based strategy, um, and, and I think this is the way to make a difference. So um, in the NAFTA discussion, we're looking at all options, but I think the best way we can do as Canadians uh, is to open up markets is to give us more flexibility where we export our wood and where is EDC making a difference. And for example, I have to applaud their work and our trade commissioner, for example, we opened an office in Singapore, the EDC recently, which is one of our best performing office uh, in the world. So uh, we are really understanding that the game is shifting in Asia and, and we have a bit, let's be honest, uh, we, I think, didn't play uh, as much as we should have, perhaps over decades. Uh, to position Canada, but we are resolved in doing that now, and I think it's with EDC, our trade commissioner, and Canadians in general, because it's business who do the business. We're there to support, and we'll certainly do that. I'm going to stretch our discussion until 9.05, just so that you can all um, have your uh, internal clocks reset there, because I want to get opinions on what happens if we pull out a NAF if, if the U.S. pulls out a NAFTA um, from our two other guests as well, and I want to take two more questions from our audience. Um, Marie, quickly, can you touch on, on what happens if the U.S. pulls out? Yeah, so I'm going to pick up on something the minister just said, which is business is done with business. So the first thing that Canadian companies need to look to is their customers. You know, the customers, regardless of what will happen in the international trade environment, there are deals in place, there are procurement arrangements in place, and Canadian companies must first look to their customers. And at this period of time, they need to be as close to their customers as possible to understand what are they thinking. Because perhaps, when we, and, and indeed when we look from an, eco, an economics perspective at the US, there is a lack of labor, there is a lack of supply in the US market. That demand will not go away. So the demand will still sit there regardless of how actually the international trade agreements work. And we see this with softwood lumber. I mean, the demand still exists. It increases the price. So I think that is perhaps a longer term thing that the Canadian companies are going to have to look at their competitiveness versus other countries. But in the short term, demand cannot go away because the consumer is still there. So my advice is Canadian companies get as extremely close to your customer, understand what they are thinking about NAFTA, and start looking at your diversification strategy. We will be there to help. We were there to help with the softwood lumber, with the softwood lumber action plan. If that's needed, we would, of course, uh, look again to where we would need to play in those spaces. Um, but there is nothing more important than staying close to your customer, first rule of business. Derek? Yeah, it might be a bit of a provincial, but I'm like kind of thinking, could it be any worse for us? Like we're just getting the stuff and kicked out of us with three trade disputes under the current kind of framework, although Softwood is outside. So I think at the end of the day, um, we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, we're, um, you know, the one thing we are watching is the, the, more, the more uncertainty there is around NAFTA, it is putting a downward pressure on our dollar, which is maybe a silver lining for the exporting folks. Um, you know, not something we'll celebrate, but, but something that's gonna help us. We're also seeing in our sector, in the near term, pretty strong prices uh, for our products in the US and around the world. So uh, there are some positive factors, I think, happening at the same time as this uncertainty. But, you know, I think about our friends in the auto sector, what does this mean to them? And how does that impact other communities near our communities? And so we're in this together and uh, we'll be, uh, you know, shoulder to shoulder with government and, and other leaders in the country here, business and otherwise, to, to find our path. Mr. Minister, how is progressive trade aligned with Canada's international assistance and broaden foreign, broader foreign policy agenda? Well, I would say uh, very much. As you know, we have a feminist uh, international <clears throat> policy. And for example, uh, when you, I was mentioning like the gender chapter, and I know some people may think this is soft diplomacy. 
Uh, but this is diplomacy that is making a difference. Uh, we were the first G7 country to do that, the, the second in the world. The first one was uh, Paraguay and Chile, and the second one was Canada and Chile. We signed that with President Bachelet. And, and I think, you know, I'll, I'll tell you something interesting. Sometime uh, I got questions from journalists say, oh, Minister, is that chapter going far enough? Are we doing enough? And I say, I'm so happy to get that question because four months ago, no one would be talking gender when we were talking about trade. So this is the way you're making a difference. And I think we're very much aligned when you're talking about the environment, you know, making sure that uh, we protect the standard and we aspire for more. That is very well aligned with obviously our position on, on the environment. And when it comes to labor and human rights, I mean, Canada is obviously there with our foreign policy. So for us uh, to make sure that uh, you know, countries don't think about lowering labor standards to be more competitive. Uh, clearly, this is advancing generally our agenda. And I think that's why I want to demystify this progressive. Progressive is just about common sense. I mean, we want to engage in trade, but we want to engage in, and I saw some of the questions about fair trade and progressive trade, is making sure that the standards are, are kept or elevated uh, to make sure that we trade on, on a fair basis among each other. And that, um, yes, we want to be out there and, and um, make a difference. And I think, and to so those- So you're saying progressive and fair trade are- Well, I, I saw one of the questions, I have the benefit of having the monitor and, and seeing the questions uh, uh, being paused. And I would say uh, progressive is just, uh, uh, these two things go together. They're fair because they're progressive in the way that, like I said, uh, countries around the world, we want to make sure that people don't use unfair trade practices to be more competitive. We want to make sure that as we trade, and I think that's what people expect, and therefore, uh, this is how it makes Canada uh, very much in line with our international assistance and our foreign policy. Um, and I must say, Canadians, I think, the polls said, people understand that at home, that this is the way to go in 2018. So, final question. Marit, I'm going to throw it to you. A key element in Canada's progressive trade agenda is incorporating a gender perspective. What's needed to make this priority real? You talked a little bit about some of the key uh, focus areas for EDC moving forward, and women is one of them. Yeah, well, I'll start by what's needed to make any priority real. Focus, investment, and measures. So you need to have the focus. Everyone needs to be focused on that priority, so alignment around that focus an investment to make sure that you can actually deliver on that priority, and then measuring the benefits and the success, having strong measures of success. It's actually going to be the same thing. It's the same thing for what we need um, to actually progress the agenda that we have for women-owned businesses, for example, focus, ensuring that we're all aligned in the organization, ensure we bring the best tools, investing in the best tools to actually make that a reality, and putting measures in to see are we making a difference. That's what's needed uh, to make it happen. Thank you to all three of you for your presence here with us today. It's most appreciated. It was great. Yes, thank, thank you. you for having thank us. You, thank you to our audience as well. Je vous remercie sincèrement d'avoir choisi d'être parmi nous pour cette session inaugurale de Before the Bell. And uh, je voudrais en, en effet encore remercier nos sponsors pour cet événement. If I could just thank once again Forest Products Association of Canada, EDC, the National Arts Centre, and Skyfly Productions for their support of this event. We hope you're going to join us for other Before the Bell events. We do try to keep it hard stop, 8 to 9 a.m., a good way to start your day with key issues that are impacting Parliament Hill and Canadians. Uh, we have a health checkup on January 30th. On February 8th, we have an event discussing international development in Canada's NGOs, and we also have a special Six Estates Spotlight discussion on vaping and harm reduction, which is taking place on January 23rd. You can get more information on any of these sessions and register at www.sixthestate.ca. You can also, of course, follow us and like us on Facebook, and you can follow us on Twitter, too. We hope you will do that regardless. Thank you once again to our distinguished guests, both here uh, on the stage with me and our earlier guests from Susan Delacourt's panel. Thank you to my co-host, Susan Delacourt. Et uh, je vous souhaite uh, bonne journée, mesdames et messieurs. Have an excellent day. Thank you for being a part of this inaugural event. Thank you.